What do you think about recording an episode this time around? <laughs> yeah, let's do it. I think I have. I have some things in me. Um, first, we need to do some housekeeping, right? Yeah. For, well, so in the last episode that we recorded, so maybe people should know that we tried to record an episode last time and it just didn't work out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that's why there's been a longer than usual gap. It was a very distracting time. Yeah. If you can remember like... Two weeks ago. Two weeks ago, which feels like 50 years ago. <laughs> so, um, but in the last recorded episode, uh, we mentioned this book. Uh, what's the name of the book? I'm just pulling it up now. <laughs> That's how long ago it was. Yes. How Design Makes the World. How Design Makes the World. And we are still going to talk about it, uh, but not in this episode because we still need to prepare. You know, because preparation is our number one priority, I think. Yeah, um, definitely. And so <laughs> we will do it in the next episode. So you still have time to read the book if you want. How Design Makes the World by Scott Birkin, B-E-R-K-U-N. And... uh yeah, it's a great. I'm really enjoying it. So I'm, yes, as am I. It'll be a good. Yeah, it'll be a good uh, read. So yeah, it's a newer book too. So that yeah, kind of is exciting. Cutting edge. <laughs> <You know. laughs> and then uh, we have a little bit of follow up. I just want to get one email. This is from. This is in reference to our COBOL discussion. Actually, still. We're still oh getting, yes. We're still getting COBOL follow up. <laughs> And uh, the only thing, I guess, so I'll just summarize. I'm just trying to find out, like, who it was from. <laughs> um, anyway, the, the gist of the email was that. It was from, yeah, okay, yeah. So the gist of the email is that, like, not maintaining, like, so not, like, updating systems is people don't think, you know, it's like people don't think of it as an expense uh, when you don't mm-hmm. maintain something. And because it's like this, it's like a non-cash expense, right? It's like like for like a building, you would call it depreciation, right? Yeah. And it doesn't cost you cash, right? But it does cost you at the end of the day. Yeah. It's like accumulating debt. Right. Well, yeah. Debt's not really the... Yeah, I guess it... I mean... <laughs> debt is like a number that you track, whereas this is... Yeah, it's, it's, like, it's like turning a blind eye to... The fact that the pipes are going to burst at some point, right? Exactly, because it's not co- it's not costing you. There's no cash outlay for that, and so it feels like you're getting away with something. And I guess, yeah, in the this callback to the episode about you need a budget, it's like that's actually when you read that book. There's a lot of um, like he really emphasized you need to budget for stuff like that, like every month. It's just like right. Something will happen and you will feel so much better. And it, it's not just like, like you can budget specifically for like car expenses or like cat expenses or, you know, whatever, something that might happen that's like fairly large. So, yeah, if you're like really on top of your game, even in like a personal realm, you would you would like add in budgeting for all these things right yeah and that's why i think that's why accounting rules force companies to do that right because it's like yeah otherwise they wouldn't (laughs) you know and then you wouldn't know like what the state of the company was like if they didn't they weren't forced to like depreciate all of their assets and things like that so yeah i mean that's like humans are just bad at this it's like we have like earth depreciation right now (laughs) 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 it's gonna be like a very high cost one day yeah 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 when the bacteria are ruling the earth, you know, they'll, they'll let us know that we screwed, that we screwed up. Yeah. <laughs> I guess that's one thing you can just die and never have to deal with it. <laughs> Do you think that, that, that might be some people's plans, I think. Yeah. <laughs> that definitely, I have had relatives where it's clear at some point they just decided like, I'm not cleaning out this house. Like, right. That's going to be someone else's problem. Uh, yeah, that's going to be someone else's problem. And it's just like, thanks, <laughs> great aunt. <laughs> <laughs> Don't knock the strategy until you've tried it. I know. <laughs> that's true. It's like, because, yeah, you lean on your relatives, but you don't have to see the consequences of it. So Yeah. Well, depending on what happens in the afterlife, right? Maybe. Who knows? Yeah, that's a good point. That's why they, inv- that's why they invented heaven. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the conversations <laughs> went to like a weird place. Yeah. <laughs> went from Koval to the Sublime, you know. Um, all right, I uh, I have like a, a lot of little tidbits that I've collected over the few weeks. I don't. Know, did you have uh, any particular thing you wanted to talk about? I mean, I did. There was this video that I tweeted last night that um, 
It, oh my, it was so fun. I don't think I've ever, like, laughed so hard. There was a few, and then I watched more from this producer, and they have, like, a few that are just, like, I was just, like, dying. But um, it was about accumulating tech debt. Oh, okay. Um, and it was, well, I, maybe not that, but it was called microservices, and it was, like, it was all about, like, the total house of cards, like, not even house of cards because that's a house it's more like duct taped like you know system that you create uh at these tech companies yeah and it's like the product person's coming in and they're just like we would like to um show users their birthday and like (laughs) the guy's like explaining why that isn't possible with like this huge diagram and then he just like has a total breakdown and i'm like this is my life. Oh. <laughs> and then it was also funny because like me and this one other guy I work with were like flipping out about it and how perfect it was and the product person I work with. But then other people were just like, whatever. And I was like, this is a problem. Like some of us like are so perturbed by how like complex it becomes. Yeah. And other people are just like, is it blocking me? No. Okay. I don't care. Right. <laughs> But yeah, it's it's a it's really good. And then they have another one that I don't want to spoil, but it's about um, like they do these all in the style. So they have one about the designer, like a designer for something, and like it's done in that kind of like documentary, like like is he gonna do something new in the future? And it's it's all about like the pad you stand on for a standing test. Ah, okay, <laughs> okay. <laughs> anyway it was i was laughing so hard at it it was so good um so yeah i recommend that if you work in tech and you care about like the total rat's nest of like data management (laughs) that happens uh it also made me appreciate how much harder it is if you have like if you're like merging companies and so then you have totally different paradigms and then and then usually, I mean, what, the reason it's funny is because usually when that happens, then an engineering team, like, builds some sort of, like, translator or something that can, like, identify all the different places. But then it's, like, that gets deprecated or, you know, and then, like, I have, like, an identifier for the identifiers. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, like, once you have that translation layer, that's just, like, oh, now you've just got another thing that's going to, like, screw you over later. Exactly. Yeah. It's a, <laughs> and then someone on there, there was like, if you like paused on the spec sheet, like the, the product thing, they had something like Korean people, question mark. And then I saw in one of the comments, I didn't follow up, but they were like, yeah, all Korean people have their birthday is January 1st or something like really weird. Mm-hmm. And it was just like, Oh, that's a weird like edge case that I never thought about. I don't know what I don't know why, but it, anyway, it was like it was one of those things where I was like, I don't work at like a highly international company yet, right. you know? Yeah, yeah. So that's like another thing where I'm like, ooh, well, that sounds painful. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Things are different in other countries. I've discovered. Yeah, very different. So and like the laws are different. They speak like different languages, and yeah. You know, <laughs> so I've heard. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I recommend that it's um the group is called like, hold on. Preparation is our number one priority. Yeah, Krizam TV. Okay. I'll send out the link, but highly entertaining i'm missing the action recently just because i haven't been on twitter for a while yeah yeah that's it makes sense that that's the first to go yeah if your life is crazy and highly recommend i need you to uh you know fill me in on what's the latest yeah i'll just fill you in on the latest things i've tweeted like (laughs) clearly the most important it is like man things like go in and out so rapidly right now where it's like oh, this is the joke everyone's saying. And then it just, I think I've talked about this before, but it's like the peak of these like jokes that burn through Twitter is so fast. Yeah. It's like, oh, last week we were all making this joke and this week we're making this joke. Right. It makes you like inscrutable to like other people. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Kind of like this podcast, right? It's totally. Kind of like this podcast. Yeah. Yeah. All these references you don't get. Yeah. Anyway, well, I had some very brief follow-up that I am sending out Patreon stickers, um, and some of them are definitely overdue. So uh, 
if you've moved, hopefully you sent out address forwarding. <laughs> yeah. But please do get in touch if you don't get one soon and you were expecting one. Um, and uh, yeah, and you know, thanks for supporting and I'm sorry about the delay. So our shipping department has, you know, it's resumed full operation. Exactly. Yes. I'm actually kind of excited because I have this label printer and um, I noticed they had this like address template. So I used it and then they auto generate, you know, that like kind of barcode thing. Yeah. It's like above your, so they like auto generated that. I was like, Ooh, cool. So what is the barcode thing for? It's for the post office for like routing the mail. So oh, okay. I guess it like makes it slightly more efficient. Although the post office is so fast sometimes, like, I don't know. I feel like first class letters, they'll get there like the next day sometimes. I mean, yeah, basically. Yeah. And that's with like, without the barcode. So, <laughs> <laughs> so now the barcode would be like same day service. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. Who knows? But so you'll have a barcode on your if you're if you're in the US. If you're international, no barcode. Yeah. You know what we didn't talk about and I almost feel like we should is the Fisher lecture thing. Yeah, so I guess there was um I think this is this issue has been mostly resolved, I think, at this point, but I think um there was an issue about renaming the Fisher Lecture. So there's a lecture that's like sponsored by the Committee of Presidents of Statistical Societies, COPS. Um, that is called the Fisher Lecture, and it's like uh, every year at the Joint Statistical Meeting, someone is selected to give the Fisher Lecture, and it's like a huge honor. And they also get an award, right? Like a Fisher Award? I don't know. I'm not entirely sure. Or the award is the lecture. Well, yeah. I don't know if there's... You mean like a, you mean like a plaque or something like that? I don't know. I thought it was not... I thought it was about renaming an award, and my tweets reflect that oh. understanding. <laughs> but... I think the award is the lecture. Yeah, so it's like interchangeable. Yes. You know? So anyway, I guess so. Daniela Witten put on Twitter that you know she suggested let's change the name of the Fisher le- lecture because Fisher was you know at best a mixed personality in history. Yeah, and he was. I mean, most notably, he was like a very prominent eugenicist. Right. Like, and towards the end of his career. Yeah, like the worst version of it. Like, oh, we should pay smart people to have kids, and like. It's so bad that so many dumb people have kids. Like he, like there's like nothing redeeming. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and uh, generally not. I think my understanding, no, like not like a great guy. <laughs> no, in general, I mean, in general, yeah. I tweeted an article. It's like he really sounded like he had major problems, like and and didn't manage them well. Like it, like it's just. <laughs> yeah. Like, really cantankerous and argumentative. Like, no one was like, he was so great to be around. It's like, he was, like, really toxic, right. I would say. Yeah. Well, and I'll say, I mean, this was, like, something kind of, like, most statisticians know. Like, it's like it's like a universal truth about him. Yeah. I mean, I think most statisticians, well, the eugenicist thing, I think everybody knows. But yeah, other aspects, I'm not sure how well. But, I mean, but they've definitely, definitely everyone knows about the eugenics. Well, and I would say that most statisticians know it, but then people outside genuinely wouldn't know. Like, why would you know about this one eugenicist? Like, eugenics in general, I think that, like, people don't learn. I don't know how it's changed, but certainly... It was like this big surprise to me to learn about eugenics in America in like the twenties, right? And how that like led to Nazis. Like it's like it's like not a big stretch. Like it wasn't. Yeah. Like you kind of learn about like how terrible Hitler was and Nazism and stuff. Is it Nazism? I don't know. Being Nazis, but like it's like it's like wasn't so far from what eugenicists were saying. Like right. Yeah. I actually meant to look up. I never did, but I wanted to look up like. What did Fisher say about Hitler? Because I feel like he would have been like kind of on board. Yeah, well, I guess I don't know. Yeah, I don't know what the timelines. Do they, yeah, I guess they do intersect. So um, yeah, yeah. I definitely feel like in close quarters, he was probably like, "Well, you know, there are too many Jews." Like <laughs> based on like everything he said, you know. Right, but anyway, getting back to this, it seems like last I saw, the cops decided to. Oh no, no, wait! I take it back. I think ASA recommended that the lecture be renamed right oh yeah i thought that it was done uh, yeah okay that's what I, I couldn't remember now so i think it's i think they decided to rename it but they don't but they're gonna figure out what, what it'll be renamed to right i don't think they've decided what it will be yeah 
Because I think, like, you know, the cops, I think, represents, I can't remember how many statistical societies, but ASA is only one of them, so. You're right, because it's, like, the leadership of the ASA has recommended the awarding organization to the awarding organization, the Thierry Fisher Award. Man, I did not, I need to get more detail-oriented. Like, I thought, I guess it is, they're calling it an award, but I was like, oh, it's done. Like, (laughs) I need to, like, read details better. Um, (laughs) So, yeah, you're right, it might. The ASA is obviously the biggest. Yeah, I mean, I think the other ones, there's like the Canadian, you know, Statistical Association, and there's like, I can't remember what the other ones are, but um, ASA is definitely the biggest one of the, all of them. And I think if they recommend, I think it'll happen. It's just a question. Yeah. Of, yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's worth noting that Daniela, when she, she tweeted this out and was kind of like, she got a lot of pushback from the committee. Yeah, um, right. Which yeah. is why I think she like kind of took to Twitter because it was, and she said specifically, she was like, oh, I was trying to figure out how to make my corner of the world better based on the, you know, national conversation happening right now. And I realized that, you know, like this Fisher Award is like a good example of like, you know, kind of, I mean, to me, it's like, I'm pretty pro changing it as I've tweeted because it's like when you're talking about an award, there's there's like an aspect of like, you should be like this person, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's just like, this is someone who I am like embarrassed to talk about him. Like, like I feel like I always have to like caveat like, oh, sorry. Eh. Like, <laughs> it is true that most of our tests are from eugenics, but like, I promise we're better now. You know, it's like, I was already so awkward about that and and felt icky about it. And like, and that's part of, I said this on Twitter and then one person kind of got mad, but like, that's part of why I feel like, like especially positive about Gossett, um, who I've obviously talked about a lot on the podcast, the creator of like the tea distribution. I don't know, Discover? Like what do you, anyway, the person who established the tea distribution. And um, it, cause he was like, not an outspoken eugenicist. Like, <laughs> He was just kind of applied. I mean, he did publish in eugenics journals, but those were like kind of like the original biology journals. So it's, but he certainly wasn't around saying like only smart people should have kids. Like, you know, he wasn't. Right. He was not like that. Yeah. So I was on board because it's like, this is embarrassing that we prop him up. And the more I think about it, the more I, I got kind of like worked up about it. Cause I was like, this is actually exactly the type of behavior that I think is like toxic and bad for academia. What, 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 like what behavior? The, uh, like oh. Fisher's behavior. Oh yeah. Yeah, as okay, a, yeah. yeah. As like a human, like, like not making any friends and like, yeah, sure. He, he, he came up with a lot of stuff, but a eventually, hopefully other people would have come up with it <laughs> and b like, he came up with it out of like spite and anger, you know, like it was, it was like to prove people wrong or to, you know, and like, it was like his, it was like probably kind of like an addiction for him. Cause like, it was like a place to go where he felt happy and otherwise clearly wasn't happy in the world, you know? So it's like, it wasn't like a healthy relationship he had with his work. Yeah. But I mean, many things come out of that kind of <laughs> <laughs> it's true where Mind, you draw the mindset line. Yeah. yeah like all famous people have a hole inside you know <laughs> yeah uh, yeah i mean i think i think what you said well two things here one is that like like you said like when you name an award after someone there's kind of an Im- implied uh, understanding that like you should want to be like this person and congratulations and like you're now like yeah this person, that was right? a moment for me too um, where i was like i honestly doubt we have a, in the last like 30 years we've awarded this to someone who was like fisher like i don't think that person would get an award in like modern society uh well i, I wouldn't necessarily go that far <laughs> <laughs> you're um, right i don't know that for sure <laughs> regardless though I, and also i think like the awards you know kind of are they kind of like stand alone right they they just kind of like they sit on someone's resume or whatever like and i think there's no like there's no context there really um like if you read about fisher in a textbook like for example if you were learning about fisher information for example right like at least like in a textbook there could be some context there right right? like because it's like a book or whatever right um and uh but things like award like these things that kind of stand alone and it's like there's no there's no way to communicate any context yeah really. no it's true and i'm actually just thinking imagine if you had that on your cv and someone just googled fisher and they didn't have any clue like they 
they were not, they were, like, in a totally different field. And it's like, oh, this person got an award because they're, like, an eugenicist. Like, it would be, like, genuinely kind of confusing. (laughs) Yeah, I guess, yeah, yeah, I hadn't thought about that. But, um, anyway, um, I'd say, because, like, I don't, I don't, (laughs) I guess one thing that's good and bad is I don't have any awards, right? So, (laughs) So I don't have to worry about this problem. But I do have I I did win one award that's named after a person, the Spiegelman Award. And um from all I know, he seemed like a regular guy. I think there should be a Gossett Award. I would I'd be into Maybe who maybe they'll yeah. rename it the Fisher Award. You should you know you should start a campaign. Yeah. Although it's like I don't it's a little tricky because it's like another white man, you know, so I'm not sure how that's going to swing. That's true. Yeah. All right. Forget it. I was I was just laughing because I got I was like a runner up for the Gertrude Cox Award, who's like a woman statistician that like so much is named after her. And I was like, oh yeah, and Daniela won it that year. <laughs> like the person who <laughs> brought this up. <laughs> yeah. I was really happy she did this though. I mean, it's you know she put herself out there and like I'm sure that I mean she's already been tweeting about like how much negative like response she's gotten about it which makes sense like i'm sure that i'm certain because i've seen them like a lot of people are mad about it um yeah but to me this wasn't even like i think dialogue has gotten so black and white in this era and i'm like i don't like that and but in this case i was like this is actually kind of like a (laughs) no-brainer Yeah, and I think, you know, one thing to factor in for me is that, like, this is, like, something that he is really known for. Like, it's just not some, like, you don't have to dig very deep at all to, like, just get, to like learn this about him. And, like, and the fact that, like, everyone in the community at least knows it, right? Yeah, exactly. It's not... Uh, it's not, like, this is, like, something that he is remembered for. Like, this is not some, you know... Yeah, it's not, like, oh, this new revelation about Fisher. It's, like, no, no, no. This is, like, very established it's not like one time one time in some in some rare random place he said one comment about one thing you know it was it's not like yeah, that at all yeah right so um so i think that plays a in my mind that plays a big totally role. yeah like it when she suggested it i was like oh that's i wish i'd thought of that like that's a really good point and that's something that was like invisible in front of me and even to the point that i like talk about him in that way and still didn't think about this you know what i mean it was like it was a pretty yeah. like close connection so i i'd be honest like i didn't really remember that there was that <laughs> that's probably part of it too she was on the committee which was why she was bringing it up because i think she because she won it I oh think. yeah um, so is everyone who won it on the committee usually that's how these things work uh like your reward for winning the award is like you get to do more work <laughs> well that's the thing though it's like if that's why I'm like, I don't think he would win it because I think there's literally too many people in the room. Like, if someone were like that cantankerous and like disliked personally, I don't think they could get a room of like 10 statisticians to be like, okay, he's so <laughs> awful and I hate him personally and I've had like bad run ins with him, but he should get this award. Like, I, I just feel like it that doesn't fly as much now, but me, I, you're right. I don't, I'm not close to it anymore. Yeah, I don't, I don't know, but. Regardless, um, like he existed in statistics when there was like not many other people doing it, so you could be like that, you know. Yeah, I mean, it was barely called statistics at that time. I think so. Yeah, I mean, anyway, the uh, I think it'll be, I think it'll be done. I think it's a matter of making sh- figure well, figuring out what to call it, and also just kind of getting sure everyone, making sure everyone's on board. Yeah, right? well, and definitely people aren't going to be on board. So, <laughs> well, I think but like, making sure that like the people in charge are on board. I think, but yeah, the people in charge are on board and are willing to like deal with the fallout. So, yeah, I think this is a pretty easy one, though. I think to in terms of like things you would want to change. Yeah, I yeah. I had some follow up actually. All right, give it to me. <laughs> so like i think this was, was this in the last episode i can't remember i was i was talking it was like two episodes ago where i was talking about like importing the tidyverse and how like it didn't feel right to me um and i was just i just thought about that a little bit more mm-hmm. <laughs> and because i was you know i'm built because i was building this like little art package and i guess it, to me it feels like I, this is like is this is like a turtles all the way down kind of argument which is that like to me it felt like i'm i'm building an interface right Mm-hmm. In order to build an interface, I need to import another interface. You know, um, it's like it's like if I were building like a, like a Windows application, it's like I wouldn't import the 
the the GUI from another application, right? Right. <laughs> like, I feel yeah. like that would be weird, right? Like you would, you would import like the level below that, right? Um, which is like the stuff that nobody that, that you don't see, right? Um, and so importing the tidyverse kind of feels a little bit like that, I guess, because like I feel like the I think of the tidyverse as like an interface to like the lower levels of R. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, but maybe that time is passing. This is what I'm wondering now. I mean, I don't know. This is like the same as the microservices thing. <laughs> <laughs> or it's like, how many layers do you want to build on top of other layers? I do think in R, that time has passed. I think I think the tidyverse has become a stable enough of a layer that that's okay. It's just R now, right? I mean, it's just... Well, I mean, again, this is the point of contention. Like, is it R? Well, I, I feel like a little bit like, you know, there's always this debate over like, what's a high level, what's a quote, high level language, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm, and totally, of course, like at some yeah. point, assembly was a high level language, right? Um, but it just keep you, know, you keep moving up the ladder. And now it's so like, what's the interface and what's the language? It's like, well, we just make, we just make that up, right? So, um, so I feel like, well, I wonder if the, at this point, maybe I'm in the wrong, like maybe the tidyverse isn't an interface. Really, it's just like, now it's just part of the language, right? But yeah, I think you're right. Like it's that's the central question, and I think I think where some of the tension is caused is that that's not all on the same page anymore. Like between the users, yes. yeah, yeah. Well, but then that gets back to the what we discussed about like load time, where it's like, wait, if it is part of the language, it does take forever to load, and that I still don't totally get. Like, yeah. <laughs> But I mean, I think that's where, again, I was mentioning Gabe Becker, like, you know, representing kind of like both sides fairly, you know, like it, it's a legit concern because if users expect art, like the tidyverse to be base R, at some point that pressures our studio to just be like, okay, we're going to make our own like R plus that is just like tidyverse R. Um, right. Yeah. So that the users don't have, they don't have this friction layer. And then that's like a schism in the community. Yeah. And and that's, like, exacerbated by the fact that there's non-standard evaluation. There's some things that, like, would not fly in our core. Right. And so, yeah. No, I agree. I agree that it's not clear. But it is. I think it's just funny because it really is the microservices thing. <laughs> yeah. It's like, now we have, like, the tidyverse microservice. <laughs> it's not even micro. It's, like big service macro yeah i mean i yeah i mean with that i don't know where i fall exactly because the like domain specific language quote unquote of our of tidyverse is like highly functional for me so right. yeah i benefit from it but i'm sympathetic to the like this is becoming an R plus situation. You yeah. know? <laughs> that would be funny if they called it R plus. I just think it would be it would be like a historical symmetry. I think Gabe make I think Gabe said that. Like he like <laughs> I can't come up with that. Yeah. Uh, like branding, but I think it's a good. <laughs> I don't I don't know actually much about the migration from S to S plus. I mean, everyone got on board with that, so. I don't know if that represented a schism at the time. Well, there was no everyone in that case, though. Yeah, I think it, because it was, first of all, the community was a lot smaller just because there was no internet. Right. And second of mm -hmm. all, like Bell Labs owned that thing. You know, it was like a full out. Mm -hmm. There was no question. It wasn't open source. It wasn't like, you know. I still don't understand versioning rules very well. Um, so it's like, why wouldn't that just be like R2.0 versus R+. plus? I mean, I guess there probably wasn't. It's not like everyone's been standardized and exactly how they version since forever right like <laughs> right yeah yeah i think i feel like right now the difference between like 0.x and then 1.x or like 1.0 is uh whether or not you tolerate breaking changes or i feel like there's something along those lines yeah whether there'd be like a major user facing break you know uh, that's like a that's like a, a major a major revision major version number change yeah mm -hmm. yeah I still can't get over the fact that my dad doesn't get what... <laughs> WFH. Yeah. Well, because I kept... It's like... I should send, I should screenshot this thing where it's like him being like, are you ever going to tell me what it means? I'm like, if you scroll up one text, I've put in quotes, work from home. <laughs> it's, it's, not, it's like, it's not absorbing in his brain. <laughs> I guess maybe it's just such a like foreign concept. Like, yeah. 
Or it's like, oh, yeah, everyone in tech is like, work from home Wednesdays. Like, it's just like a thing that everyone knows about. Right. But, yeah. One of our 50 million. Like, do you know what OOO means? No, that I don't. Out of office. Oh, okay. How about, I mean, PTO. Do you know that one? Is that paid time off? Yeah. Okay. So you kind of like, oh, wait, people oh. have different. This is a good game. Can we do like the corporate uh, <laughs> abbreviation? Uh, like. <laughs> God, competition yeah well poc is an interesting one because oh. that one has like four that there's three distinct meanings that you would bring up in a business context okay but hang on a second i'm glad you brought that up because we got an email from someone <laughs> a, uh, a listener i'm looking this up mm-hmm. right now who mentioned something about p this is it says POCs were done on a couple of occasions, but the financials never seem to work out, and it is still in COBOL. They're talking about like a system, an old system that was built in COBOL. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. do you know what that means? Yeah. Okay. Do you? you? you do, I have no clue. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. This was this is one that. That's the thing. You end up using them almost equally. I shouldn't say almost equally, but. So, do you want to guess, or do you want me to just tell you? Uh, I'm gonna okay. Can I guess the letters individually? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Does P refer to profit? No. Oh, okay. Um, product? No. <laughs> okay, I'm out. <laughs> did they? Here's the question: Did they make the O little? It's all caps. Yeah. Well, sometimes they make it little. In I this. see. Well, I guess in, yeah. Anyway, do you want to know? Yes. It's a proof of concept. Wow. I never would have guessed that. Okay. Yeah. Like, reread the sentence. I want to make sure, but I'm like 90% sure. So this person it says, um, they're talking about a system that was built in COBOL. Okay. And then they say, there have been discussions about refactoring it with a more modern architecture. POCs were done on a couple of occasions, but the financials never seemed to work out. Yeah, so proof of concept works there. That totally makes sense. Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. <laughs> wow, I learned something really new. Okay. <laughs> that told. Totally, okay, now it's like mystery solved. I feel like. Yeah, it solves it. Yeah. So that's one of three meanings. So one. So one is person of color. Right. Yeah. And then what's the third one? Like, do you want me to use it in a sentence? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Hello. Yes. Yeah. So it'll be like Hillary will be your POC going forward. Point of contact. Yep. Okay. All right. I think I've actually seen that one in usage in the wild. I don't use POC to mean person of color at work that often, you know, like, although more recently, obviously, but um, I usually see that like it'll be, that doesn't come up in work as much, you know, but yeah, just saying like proof of, I say, I probably use proof of concept and person of contact like equally. Yeah. Can you give me one more? <laughs> I know. I'm like, let me open up my calendar. And just, like, like, can you just open your email and pull out a random abbreviation? Because, <laughs> like, half of them, I like the ones that come from the product team. I'm just going to search for emails from one specific person and be like, let's see. Um, <laughs> well, there's there's a lot that are almost any like internal product become like I'm, I'm looking at an email I, I just search for emails from one product person and there's a lot that are like our internal projects okay so, that's not really yeah yeah, yeah. those won't I'm actually right. you know the person who actually uses it the most is the people from um the people from like our strategy team so the people who are kind of like consulting background uh-huh. um so I just found one and it's um xfn X F N, yeah. Oh, okay. Hold this on. one might be a Stitch Fix specific one. I'm not totally sure. Okay. Well, we'll hear about it. Let's see. Is X like cross something? Mm-hmm. Cross functional. Yeah, you got oh, it. All right. All right. That's pretty good. <laughs> I'm feeling pretty good about it. I feel like yeah. I could work in the corporate world, maybe. <laughs> I mean, the biggest one that I have to describe to people who aren't in um like 
don't work in tech is just what the word product even means. <laughs> uh, okay. Because it has like a pretty, especially both at Etsy and at Stitch Fix, it's like we actually work with like physical products, right? Right. And yeah. so even within the company, when you're talking to people from our merch team, they're like, oh, the product is coming in next week or something, you know? Right. And they have a different meaning for that word. Yeah. But like somehow everyone like gets it when you're talking about like the product team versus the merch team, even though the merch team buys product. Like it, <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> There's obviously like all the KPI ones. KPI being one, of course. Um, yes. But you know that one. That one, key performance indicator. Yeah, which yeah. I had to learn. I mean, I had to learn all of I'm still learning it. I had to learn it all coming from <laughs> academia. Yeah. I didn't know it. Like there's like, like CR, like conversion rate. Which, okay. Like everyone talks about, but... Um, <laughs> And I'm just like I said, I'm just like going through. Like, <laughs> okay, we know we can't. We, we don't want to blow through them all. We want to. We want to like parcel these out over multiple episodes. Yeah, I'll I'll figure out some more because I'm <laughs> now I'm excited about like <laughs> all the ones. So many. Yeah, it, when I'm looking at some point, so a lot of them are internal, but I feel like any business person, like business school, you're just like littered with them. Yeah. My my dad brought up one that. Like, if you remember some of the stuff from the podcast, was relevant in the podcast, which was BATNA. Oh, best alternative to a negotiated agreement. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. And my dad was bringing it up. He was a lawyer. So I was like, oh. That's a good, yeah. I think that's a pretty well known one, actually. Um, I would have never known it until I read that book that we read, The um, Getting to Yes. Yeah. Well, I think it's, yeah, I think just because of the popularity of that book, you know, it's just. Right. Yeah. Like they invented the term. Right. Yeah. And there's, yeah. I mean, there's all the financial like EBITDA. Yeah. Everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. yeah but... Our CFO at, at Stitch Fix like kind of made a big deal about like educating us on what that meant. Every all hands. Like, <laughs> like everyone say it, EBITDA. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta, one day you're going to write a folk song about it, right? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's a really. I bet they're already out there. It's. Uh, I don't know why it's Stitch Fix that was especially relevant, but it was for some reason. That metric. Yeah. I think it's relevant at a lot of younger companies. I see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, do you want to talk about data science? Uh, yeah. Well, I thought we were. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, POC proof of concept. That is like helpful because you end up building a lot of proof of concepts. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, maybe this is a way to transition into the what I want to talk about next. Okay, go for it. I want to talk about math. Oh, I don't know if I can help you there. <laughs> well, I mean, let's be clear. I don't know any math, but like, <laughs> but so I was thinking about because I, you know, I do this on a somewhat regular basis, which is that I have a conversation with someone about a project and they want to do some study or they want to do some analysis, and. Um, and we just talk about it, and we talk about it, right? Like using using words, and it's just like it, at some point it reaches the point where I'm just like, I'm like in a rage because like I don't really understand what they're trying to do. Yeah, you know, and I just want to like write down an equation, right? Right. Like mm -hmm. a model or an estimator or or whatever, you know. Mm -hmm. And unless the other person is like another statistician, which is like rare, right? Um. That doesn't help them. It helps me, right? <laughs> totally. Yeah. Yeah. yeah for like, sure. And so, like, but I was thinking that, like, you know, we talked about in the past how, like, when we talked about the design stuff, like, we talked about building, like, a, uh, either sketching something down on paper or actually building, like, a rough, like, model, like a physical model, right? Like, I'm going to say, when I say physical model, I mean, like, out of, like, paper or cardboard or something like that, right? Right, right, right. Um, yeah. And, uh, and we talked about how, like, you know, some, in many ways, like plotting is like kind of like our version of sketching mm -hmm. for data analysis. For data analysis, yeah. Um, but I think another tool, sketching tool, really is like is math, right? For sure. Yeah, I agree with that. I hadn't thought about it really in the in that way, uh, but it's a it's a way to sketch models, right? Basically. Yeah, and it's like a way to summarize like a complex concept in like a very efficient way. Yeah, and also when it's like when you yeah exactly, and I think it serves the same role as mo as sketches do in the sense that like when you see it there in front of you, you it's very it becomes very clear often like what's right and what's wrong. Mm -hmm. um, totally. 
and uh, and I you know, I feel like many times I've written something on the board uh, in my office. And it's like here's the model that you're talking about, and here's the parameter that you're trying to estimate, and it's like oh no that seems weird <laughs> you know it's true that it's like it's not if your brains it's almost like you'd be better served to be like can you sit tight for a second and like write it out for yourself and then translate then you can have a conversation where you're like okay i think i wrap my head around it yeah are you interested in the math they'll probably say no <laughs> <laughs> And then you can spend time translating the result. You didn't have to do the thinking in English. You can just translate the result you got from math back into English, you know? I, yeah, right. So you have like a little internal discussion amongst yourself, right? Exactly, yeah. 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 That comes up, yeah, like interaction terms are the perfect example where oh. it's like you seriously, it's like 50 words. To like... <laughs> just to say what it is, right? Yeah. Yeah, but like everyone, like and then that's the thing. If you're in a big group of data scientists, statisticians, mathematicians, you can just say it and everyone's like, yep, I know. Like, is there an interaction term? Oh, good question. We should look at that. You know, like right. there's not, you don't have to be like, oh, well, is the difference between men and women yeah. different than the difference between men? <laughs> anyway. That's like my whole life now. I feel like everything I encounter now is like everyone's looking at some sort of interaction. Uh, oh, yeah, it's like sure. I feel like people have like run out of main effects, you know. <laughs> I mean, it makes sense. Like, I mean, plus it kind of like follows the thought of science to some degree, where it's like for a long time, like the world evolving. Where it's, I mean, even not to <laughs> this is probably a stretch, but even like the like Black Lives Matter thing is kind of about an interaction effect, right? Uh, yeah, people experiencing things quite differently. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Like. If you go from like police intervening to not police intervening or not not interacting with police to interacting with police, there's like a main effect difference of like how often that happens. And then like an interaction effect of like the consequence. That's not that's like a terrible phrasing of it. But you get what I mean. Like, yeah. Well, and that's like, yeah, I mean, it's. Yeah, there's a heterogeneity in the way that different people experience anything, really. Um, and so that's what people want to explore now i mean yeah exactly like that's and again that's kind of like the world is getting more attuned to that yeah i think overall and that's overall good i think um but it makes the analysis harder (laughs) (laughs) uh because you need way more data right i was gonna say it's mostly a sample size issue which is why I remember at the um, Women in Data Science conference that I spoke at in 2019, um, a woman was talking about clinical trials and the fact that it was like some huge percentage of people like aren't eligible for them. And so if you really, if you like follow that thread, it's like the chances that if you're taking a drug, they actually studied the impact on someone like you is like pretty small. Yeah. And so it's like, oh, this is actually, like, troubling. That <laughs> like, there's a lot of, like, potentially false assumptions that are happening. Like, you're taking drugs with, like, with like a, a big leap of faith to some degree. Right, because they weren't exactly tested on someone like you. I mean, it's yeah, unlikely exactly. that they were. Yeah. And, like, potentially nev- most, like, almost, like, if you're in, like, a pretty minor category for whatever dimension you think it matters on, like probably never (laughs) been tested on someone like you. Yeah. Well, I mean, and it's not like there's necessarily like something wrong here. It's just that, you know, for like a phase three clinical trial, you want that population to be fairly homogeneous, you know, regardless of what, where you kind of decide the definition of the population is like, you don't want there to be a huge variation in the population because you won't see the effect like there won't be an effect probably right yeah or, or if you and you won't know why <laughs> necessarily yeah. um and so but there isn't usually any once the phase three trial is done pe- then usually it's like they're just going to market right there isn't like another trial where they say okay let's see how it works in the community or in like a broader population yeah it's um it's almost like we'd be better served if people had to like state the caveats of the um population recruitment in the like 
disclaimers. Like, add another line to the, like, 500 disclaimers that they say. <laughs> like, on the label of the, of the bottle or something? Yeah, like, this was tested for white men between these ages. So, if <laughs> right. you're not that, like, roll of the dice. Except, I mean, it's... In many cases, it's not a roll of the dice, obviously, but it, right. yeah. There's an element of like human biology involved, but um, but yeah, no, it is. it could be quite different, I think. Yeah, so. Um, that's actually, well, I mean, that's like a big topic now in, uh, in biostatistics, which is like treatment effect heterogeneity. You know, I, not just biostatistics, it's kind of everywhere now, but mm-hmm. um, this kind of treatment effect heterogeneity. I mean, I think when I am considering treatment for myself, I think about that constantly where i'm like okay they small they saw a small effect like effect size in the trial but was this because there were some people where it was amazing for them and then a lot of people where it didn't do anything because then that's like a roll of the dice i want to take right (laughs) versus like if it's just a like small for everyone then it's like nah do i really care about this like tiny improvement in my life that i'll get you see what i mean right right yeah, so in my non-scientific <laughs> thinking of it. Yeah. How did we get on interact? Oh, we were talking about writing them down. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I think I think it's fair to say. I mean, that might be an, an interesting thing for... Um, I mean, because you hear people talk about how math is so creative, right? And yeah. I agree with that. And it is like... Um, it's yeah, like if you're doing if you're proving new things, it is a very creative process. Yeah, I think yeah, I think math in its pure form is requires a lot of creativity. Um, yeah, but and I mean, so you could potentially make the case that like that is a form of design thinking. Yeah, I think so. I think I mean, I don't think you have to be like a mathematician, right? It's, it's not, I'm not really talking about being a mathematician, which which is a job that's very different, I think, right? Then just using math as this tool as this like sketching tool um to to just to kind of make ideas concrete basically right well and then you also get like already i feel like most mathematicians would just be like yeah we've been on board with this for a while because it's like called a language you know like it's like the international language of math or um so it's it's in both these cases with like programming language with math like, like people already use the term language to describe it right there's also there's already like an intuitive understanding but i guess i guess the thing that layering on the design thinking gets you is sort of the paradigm of like this is a different type of intelligence or like this is this is how you like you said have that conversation with yourself right um not a different type of intelligence, maybe, but it well, sort of, because it's like a it's like a way to tap into that like what do they call it the like productive thinking, <laughs> productive, but like the um, not deductive like appositional, I think. Yeah, abductive. Abductive, yes. yeah, and so uh, yeah, it's a it's a nice it's a good example, but yeah, I feel like I feel like you would be well served to just be like. I need a minute (laughs) (laughs) rather than trying to like bring someone along with your thinking. Well, yeah. I mean, I think you could debate whether it's like a good tool for kind of communicating certain ideas. Like I think it's, it works for me. Right. But I, I, you could debate whether it's like a good idea to be like, this is the one tool that everyone needs to know. Um, So, but like, like you said, like you could have a conversation amongst yourself and then like, and then, you know, once you've clarified what, what you're trying to do. I mean, I yeah, it's that's almost just like, are you talking to someone who's fluent in it or not? Right, and, right, yeah. Yeah, and like, I don't think everyone needs to be fluent in it. I don't know. Maybe that's wrong. I don't know how I feel about that statement, actually. <laughs> I know, I think in general, it's fine. Like, I think people need to know so, some amount of math, right? But like, not at this level necessarily. But one tricky issue, though, which is that, you know, which is caused by this, like, you know, interest in data science that has arisen, right? Is that like everyone is, there's a lot of people who are kind of like on the boundary, I think, of like, do they need to know it or not, right? Mm-hmm, yeah. Uh, and, and I think that that, that that population is like growing every day because cause data science is like everywhere now, right? Totally, yeah, that's and, a good point. And then so now it's like, it's harder for me to say, well, none of these people, you know, need to know this this way of communicating right yeah and that's what caught me up too i was like 
Mm, but I do feel like everyone should learn some ways of doing data analysis. So how is this not like similar? <laughs> yeah, right. Like, um, anyway, I don't know. I don't have any answers right now. But I think um, it's, so that's kind of like where I I, cause I hesitate sometimes because like sometimes I'm talking to people who are like, you know, they're very smart. It's not like they don't know what they're they have concrete ideas in their mind. They just express them in different ways. And I think, you know, bridging that gap is, is the problem. And whether it's like we all learn a math or we all learn something else. Like, I mean, yeah, I know, is, is math the universal? It's like the English of like scientific thinking or not. <laughs> I mean, it's funny because that, I mean, it all just becomes simple if you think about it as a language because it's like, you personally are well served to learn as many languages as possible. Like if your goal is to communicate with all people, Right. Um, and that I was thinking about that just from like, I think I feel like my message in all my talks has been like data scientists need to learn more of the language of design, language of art and like expression. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. and, and furthermore, I was thinking while you're talking about that, I was thinking about like, gosh, I feel like I've had a real moment at work of thinking about like, most of the things I can look at as conflicts at work, I think do come down to just like being oceans apart with other people in terms of how we think and like the assumptions we have that the other people think that way. And then like the ways in which our things hit them so wrong, you know, like we hit each other really wrong sometimes because it's like, well, if you say that and you think in this one way like I remember really early on I was talking with a data scientist and I was talking about a change we can make to the onboarding flow and I was just kind of like spitballing ideas yeah. and um, it definitely went for something really radical where I was like oh we could do this and he got like really upset and like talked to his manager about like Hillary's trying to like ruin the onboarding flow <laughs> <laughs> And it's like, yeah, if you're kind of thinking like an engineer or like, you know, I can see how that was like challenging if you're like not totally trusting the other person. And, you know, it's just like it's like he couldn't totally wrap his head around the fact that I was just in this like kind of like design mindset and not actually suggesting what my plan was. And then and then I was bothered. Right. Because it's like I didn't totally appreciate the fact that that would hit him that way you know so it's anyway i can think of like so many examples of that um i think but that's why i said you should just like be like i need a moment it's just like respecting the fact that the other person doesn't speak that language <laughs> yeah yeah that's yeah a good point. yeah it's hard though i mean it's it's like i find this to be like one of the hardest problems because there are people that i interact with at work that i am just like it is completely foreign to me how you think like it I can't even begin to wrap I can't I can't even like I didn't even realize this was possible and so <laughs> I just like it didn't compute that it would even be a problem because I didn't realize you'd be thinking that way you know and like and not in a wrong way at all but just in such a different way than how I'm used to operating um, yeah. And this is partly why I'm like, maybe I'm not a data scientist because like that happens like frequently with like the people within my org. Right. Um, but I think the more I've thought about it, I do think it's more of this like engineering, like so many data scientists like really are engineers. And so I actually think that's where it comes up the most. Like I am not an engineer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I think in just, um, but there's a conflation of kind of like a lot of the skills you need do come from the engineering side. Um, but, uh, and so I think that, that kind of that style of thinking comes along with it probably. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I work with a, um, I work, it's funny cause I feel like in that conversation you describe, I'm usually the other person who's like, wait, okay. why are you writing an equation? <laughs> and oh, so, okay. Yeah. And so the, um, I work with a consultant, um, from the creative org who, helps me like translate this stuff like he'll meet with someone that I'm like I'm really having trouble with this communication and he'll be like oh, okay that person's just trying to get to the math problem as fast as possible like and so like you're stuck in like wanting to explore all the options and they're trying to just get to whatever will make the math problem happen as quick as possible you right. know and so that's where that's where like the and that's, again, it's like, I think what's caught me up is that I'm like, wait, but we're in the same org. So, like, 
we should be thinking the same way, but it's just not, I'm appreciating more of the diversity within the set of data scientists, you know? Yeah, yeah. 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 So the reason why I'm like, I don't feel like I'm data scientist sometimes, and I don't, I don't actually think that. I don't want people who are listening to think like, if you feel like you think the way I am, you can't be a data scientist, you know? Right. But, um, but it is like, it is like not being motivated by not wanting to get to the math language is, I feel like in my experience, especially with kind of like production data scientists, feels a little bit more rare than even like analyst focused data scientists. Uh huh. So, yeah. That's not, I mean, that's not totally fair, but that's just been my experience so far. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'd say, I mean, to, I, in these, in certain, in these situations that I kind of originally described, uh, most, almost everybody, I would say, has been, open to the idea of like let's write some equations down even if they're not like necessarily comfortable uh with it and um and i think part of it i think just has to do with just kind of where i am right in terms of this environment is right you know everyone has some math background probably from college or whatever right um and so it's not like it's not totally foreign right and most people have taken some like statistics class or something like that so um, yeah. So there's... But you probably overwhelm people like right away. Like it's like <laughs> <laughs> What do you mean? Oh, like it's like it's like being like, "Oh, I speak a little French." And then you like go to a movie and you're like, "Oh my god, it's like coming at me so fast. <laughs> right. I can't stop it." And like it's like I I lived in France for a year and I could have like a long conversation. I remember I had like a half hour conversation with someone and I was like so proud of myself. I can never watch French movies. Like I watched the movie Amelie so many times and then when i finally let myself watch it with subtitles there were like huge portions of the plot that i'd never picked <laughs> up you know <laughs> so it's just like <laughs> i mean people talk about that like movies are kind of the hardest that can be one of the hardest things to do if you're if you have a new language so i feel like that's what happens people are like probably those people would love it if you already had the equation and you were like okay let me show this to you take a minute and then like i'll walk you through it or you know what i mean yeah 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 but watching like an expert kind of like half think to themselves in the language would be i mean i get overwhelmed with that Yeah, yeah yeah no i can see that yeah i have to say i think that like i think i probably used to think in math terms more and it's, I think it's gone down a lot since I became so product focused where it's like, I feel like the value I add to, you know, my team and my org is like being so hyper focused on like, okay, but how is this going to show up in the client experience? And that isn't going to matter. Or like this one will matter a ton. Like, cause it's easy to lose sight of that if you get so focused on like, oh, this is a really interesting nuance. And it's like, and I've done that too, where it's like. Oh, I really want to focus on this like intricacy of like it'll be really cool to figure this out and it's like as a product person you just have to be like nope not important enough stop thinking about it move on like, right yeah <laughs> yeah well there's I should say there is a flip side to this whole discussion right which is that like the is the overuse of, <laughs> of <laughs> well not the over I would say the 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 I the, I see this a lot with people kind of like when they do learn the math and then they see it as like, oh, this is the solution to everything, right? Oh, totally. I mean, yeah. I think I think that's the biggest problem in data science. Yeah, because it, it gives you that feeling of like, ah, oh, I'm being super precise right now, right? Um, and uh, and that's always a good thing, right? Mm-hmm. Um, right. And uh, yeah, there's, uh, I guess it'd be, I, I should mention that side too, right? But no, to- I mean, yeah, and that's where my like, yeah, that's, I'd say, like, most of the conflict I've had is, like, that conflict of, like, you know, the precision of the math problem versus, like, the product applicability. And that's where that's where the tension is because, like, you know, it sucks if you're, like, in the middle of, like, thinking about, like, a cool statistical application and then a product person comes and, like, throws a wet blanket on it and is, like... Right, yeah. But I think, like, the job of the... Da- well... I shouldn't say what the job of the my uh, you know envisioning of what the job of the data scientist is, is to bridge that gap right between like the equation and the reality right uh, yeah and yeah. that's I think it's just really hard and so it's it's like it, they're two really different ways of thinking and you have to be able to flip from one to the other right yeah yeah and that's and you have to be able to meet people in both places because like 
ideally in a diverse org, you do have people who are just hyper focused on the engineering task or like the modeling task. And those people benefit from a translation layer. Um, Although, I don't know. I mean, that's where I'm like, oh, God, I don't even know anymore. Because, like, maybe not. Like, maybe it would be better to have those people, like, build that skill set. Or I, it's – that's kind of like an org-level decision of – and a person-level decision of, like, how they want to grow. Um, I mean, when you look at, like, how – like, if you take the data science out, like – most companies, the solution is to have a product person who kind of like speaks all the languages and then you have an engineering team that's like takes a lot of direction from the product person. You have designers like like the product person sort of acts as that master translator. You right. Know? Yeah. 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 And obviously it goes easier when everyone is like like if you have engineering people who really get where the designers are coming from, then like there's not as much tension. And, right. But yeah, it's. It's a lot. <laughs> this uh, so the last thing I wanted to mention, and this is a speaking of the master translator. Um, so I just got this book. Um, there's like a lot of books being mentioned now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but it's this, it just came out. I, I guess I saw it. This like back when I was still looking at Twitter. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, the I, I saw it from Paige Bailey. You know, Paige Bailey, follow her on Twitter. Uh, uh, she's at oh, I want to say Microsoft. Yeah. Um, anyway, she sent a link. I, you know, one thing I didn't know, you know, Stripe, the, you know, the payments company, mm-hmm. they have like a publishing arm. I did not know that. It's called Stripe Press. Wow. We even know someone there who used to be there, <laughs> Alyssa. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah. yeah. And they publish, I don't know how old or new it is, right? Like it could be a recent thing, but they publish like select technical books. Um, and wow. what, and a book that they published is this book called Art of Doing Science and Engineering, uh, by Richard Hamming. Uh, Hamming. He was famously like, office mates with Claude Shannon, you know, at Bell Labs. Um, oh wow! Yeah. So and uh, Claude Shannon. Oh my God, what a hero! <laughs> I like. I I think I we talked about it, but I mean, talk about someone who is so creative and like yeah, bridges that gap very well. Yeah. I think you might enjoy this book, but um, it's uh, he it, I first encountered. So he wrote like a famous essay called "You and Your Research," um, about like how to do kind of good research uh and i saw this essay like back in 2003 like when i was starting out um and i guess this book is like compiled from a course that he taught um on just kind of like doing basically on just doing research or or doing kind of science and engineering stuff and one of the topics that he talks about is systems engineering which is like um a thing that he was interested in Mm -hmm. and um is that what you sent me yeah well i sent you an article that he refers to um, I sent you an article that was written by like a bunch of people at NASA on um, systems engineering, and and in, anyway, I without like getting into too much of the details. He says one of the kind of the laws of like system and en- systems engineering is that optimizing any one part of the system leads to an overall decreased performance. Mm. Right, mm-hmm. um, and I, I think that's a lot of what we see in like the situation you were just describing, like which is that like any one part of the organization can optimize all they want. But mm-hmm. it would often will lead to an overall decrease in kind of quality or performance or whatever you want to call it. You know, that sort of reminds me of this thing that the consultant. I always call him the consulting guy because like no one in the company really knows him since <laughs> he is. But his name's Ken Zaloom, which is quite the name. But um, he uh, he always says if you have a good negotiation or a good. I guess I don't know exactly how you phrase it, but like a good negotiation means everyone walks away a little disappointed. Right. Yeah. Like everything is like slightly suboptimal, right? Yeah. Like there's like you have to compromise. I mean, that sounds like such a cliche, but right. Yeah. Um. Anyway, so it's uh. Anyway, I, so I think the I I remember because like I remember I worked at one of my few times where I like worked at a <laughs> at a company. Um, <laughs> There were, it was at, I think I've mentioned this before, I was at this military contractor, and mm-hmm. um, the there was a whole, like, there was a position at the company called Systems Engineer, um, and they were all, and they were basically in charge of, like, interfacing between, like, the the customer, which was always, like, a military, it was, it was usually the Navy, and um, and then, and all, of, like, the people developing the software, which was us, and, um, and, because they had to, like, figure out, like, what were, what were all the priorities and, like, how to translate that into, like, building the product. And, uh, and I think that is like 
to me, I think that is the job of the data scientist. I wouldn't, maybe it's not equivalent to like systems engineer, but I think it's like your job is to balance like a lot of different priorities, I think. Okay, so I usually I'm like, yeah, you're totally right. But I feel like I've gotten to a place now where I always want to caveat that with like, I do think there's a version of data scientist that is basically like an engineering role. Yeah, I think that yeah. is, that is. Like a production data scientist. I, I, yeah, but I think. Like if you're more of like a full stack data scientist or especially a data analyst maybe with a data scientist job title or whatever. I think you're right that for many roles that data scientists do, the systems building is part of it. Yeah. 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 Uh, or at least, the, yeah, at least the kind of understanding of the system. Mm -hmm. Because, like, there may not be any one person who uh, can kind of, who cares about the whole system, I guess, maybe. Yeah. Well, I think maybe with the engineering thing, it's it's better to say, like, what aspect of the system are you thinking of? Like, are you thinking of the engineering system? Because then it's like, you know, talking about what, like, workflows and what alerting should we have? And, like, I guess that's why I'm like, it's like, there's almost like just a huge engineering task because it is like, okay, how do we build, like, the system needed to run production code? And then that gets really, really close to what engineering looks like, you know? But with like this added specialty of like, like modeling, you know, millions, billions of data points or, you know, um, versus if you're like a product oriented data scientist, it's like you're thinking of the full system of like the data collection or, you know, like a totally different aspect of it. Yeah. And being expert in both is like, I, I'm like decreasingly, <laughs> being an expert in both is like, oh, we're going to solve our problems with like unicorns and 10x people. Like. Yeah, I mean, I don't think, that's not exactly what I'm, that's not really what I'm talking about. But I do think that um, the, the I mean, I think also because it, it comes up, I think, depending on the size of the organization, right? I think. Uh, like you work in a much larger kind of setting really than I do. Um, and so in that kind of thing, there is more specialization, I think. Yeah, um, totally. Just because there has to be, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, what's my point? My point is that... <laughs> well, like for your role, you definitely have to be... I mean, you're essentially your own PM is how I would... Okay, yeah. yeah. I mean, I think I find myself in this, that like in this kind of, when I'm in this situation, um, the more I can kind of do that, the better the outcomes. Um, mm -hmm, but, for uh, sure. it's, uh, but it's a, it's a very small scale operation compared to like what you have to work with. Well, yeah. And I mean, this is where the growing pains happen because it's like, if you, again, it's like if you optimize for one part of it, it's like worse overall. Like, are you optimizing for total autonomy? Because, like, clearly with product teams, eventually they're like, okay, we're going to take away your autonomy in, like, and kind of have, like, someone steering the ship, right? And then that, like, do data scientists start to fall under there? And then do you embed the data scientists onto the team? And then, you know, right. and then yeah. most data scientists are like, oh, I don't like that. It's... <laughs> it's <laughs> So, yeah, it gets gets tricky. But I do think data scientists get away with acting autonomously. Well, I don't I don't know if that's true. That might just be in my org since we have our own C level, but um C level is something that I didn't know. <laughs> we have a really, chief algorithms officer, so we have a chief. That's not really an al an acronym, right? It's more like it's just a letter, right? So yeah, but also, like, if you don't know it, you think people are saying, like, SEA level. Oh, uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, which yeah. is, like, a totally, like, common thing to say. <laughs> like, rising sea level. Yes, like, right. Yeah. You're not, you don't mean, like, people getting, like, climbing the corporate ladder. <laughs> right. <laughs> Into the C-suite, right? Yeah, the C-suite. That one makes more sense. Yeah. So. Maybe I should call it the C-suite. We just don't have a suite. Like, it's like an open office. So. Right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like our CEO, like, sits kind of, like, at a table in the corner. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. I don't know where our president sits. It's oh. like she was here for a month, and then we're all work from home. So. It's, yeah. she She's just out there. That's sort of an interesting thing. I'd be interested in the academic version of this. Is like you, you're seeing everyone at home, right? So it's like all of our people, like super high up, you see their home environment. Right. Um, 
Yeah, and so it's like, oh, okay, I'm seeing what this person's situation is. <laughs> the biggest thing I've noticed is that, like, I feel like such a tech nerd because all of those people are clearly just working at, like, their MacBook Air. You know, like, they have not optimized it for, like, I look like I'm on camera. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I'm like, oh, they're not distracted by, like, this, like, playing around with, like, the way that we are, like, ooh, let's look at Ethernet cords. Right. <laughs> yeah. It's, like, wearing earbuds and, like, you know, it's just, like, simple. Like, it's just, like, whatever yeah. the common thing is, they're doing it. Whatever's the least amount of work, yeah. Whereas I've got, like, a monitor arm, and I've got, like, a fancy camera, and I've got my, like, moss wall backdrop, and I'm yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. It's like, oh, yeah, like, people are like, you look so professional, and I'm like, but do I look like I'm trying too hard? Because, like, when I see the sea levels, they don't look like they're trying too hard, so. Well, maybe there's, like, a certain, like, when you enter the C-suite, there's, like, a certain, there's, like, a rule book that you get. You know, yeah, it's, it's like, like you, you need can't... to downgrade so right. it like, seem approachable. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> right. Like, you don't want to see, like, be, like, in this, like, tower of, like, you know. I bet it's true that people, like, if you're, like, wealthy, you don't, you probably, like, purposefully move to a part of the house where you're not, like, look at my amazing house. Like, <laughs> I don't know. There's, yeah. There's actually a really interesting account about people putting bookshelves behind them. Um, oh, it's like, yeah. <laughs> it's just like this person has screenshots of people's like books and like how well they did to like establish credibility. Right. <laughs> it is funny because we talked about what about, about Bob, where it's like they pointed out once when someone just had like a row of their own books like prominently displayed. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> I don't have any books. I, uh... <laughs> well, you can like have your like Kindle out there in the background, right? <laughs> You know, you should, you should have your Kindle just, like, flipping through, like, all the books that you... Just have my Audible thing, like, scrolling. Right. Like, yeah. I just say the first time... I don't know if you... Did you ever go to, like, the dean's office at the medical school? Have you ever been no. there? At Hopkins? Mm -hmm. It is, like, the first time I went there, I was like, I thought I entered a different university. Like, like yeah. it was, like... First of all, it's in this super nice building on the top floor, and it's, like... Yeah, it's totally, and, and then in contrast, like, because the, the School of Public Health, the, the dean's office is actually, like, it's, like, practically in the basement. Like, it's on the first floor, right? <laughs> yeah. And it's, like, I mean, it's nice, but it's, like, it's on the first floor, right? It's not, like, lofty and, like, you know, in the heavens, right? Yeah. Um, which I feel like is kind of nice, actually. I remember when I interviewed, at, like, somewhere for an academic job, I went to the dean's office, and it was, like, it was the same as what you're talking about. Like, it was... I still have such a memory of the view because it was on like a body of water and uh -huh. it was just like the huge windows looking out like yeah. directly onto like it was like you were like feet away from it <laughs> and it was it was like it was like so big yeah. and beautiful. I guess there's like it's for fundraising, right? I don't know what it's for to be honest. I think it's just a uh... I mean, I guess they come to the office. I suppose they come to the office, yeah. Yeah, but I, I feel like it's like a, it's like an it's like the White House. It's like an office that's like for function. Yeah, like it has yeah. a job to do. The Oval it's Office. Like, the function yeah. is not doing work in it. Like, right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the function is bringing people in, but it's just like a question of who are they trying to impress? Because yeah. like, that's not the way to impress academics. So. Right. <laughs> but they they could give a damn about the academics. <laughs> yeah. It's like you kind of like piss off the academics if you do that. <laughs> right. Which I also think is the it's goal. Like, Why do you have so much money? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Maybe that is the goal. It's like it's like a it's like a like a beta move. It's like that's right. It's like an alpha move, I should say. Yeah. Like, like I will dominate you in any salary negotiation. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> I never went to that. I never went. But I did tutor the president's kid at Hopkins. Okay. So I got to go into, like, the residence, and that was, like, pretty exciting. Oh. I mean, like, the like where the president's, president lives. Yeah. Yeah, because okay. it was his son. So it was, like, yeah. And um, yeah, I was tutoring in statistics. Like, <laughs> being a stats tutor, like, you get a lot of, you know, you have access to all slices of society. Yeah. <laughs> I, I guess there's a lot of work being a stats tutor, I have to say. Yeah, for sure. It was, though. It was, yeah. Man, tutoring was a great gig. <laughs> <laughs> One of these days, I want to I see you on, like, a conference call with, like, a, like a presidential seal behind you, you know? Like, <laughs> yeah, I need to add more to my backdrop. You need like, more, like, power and, like, uh, I don't know. 
Well, I mean, apparently, like, Obama did that town hall, and he had just, like, kind of books, you know? Like a bookshelf that's, like, populated with various things. <laughs> it is funny, because, like, it is... People put so much thought into it, clearly. Like... Yeah. Yeah. So. Well, I think even before today's day and age, like, I think people put a lot of thought into their bookcases, right? I mean... Oh, yeah. yeah I think it's it's independent of, like, the work-from-home thing, right? I mean, I think... Yeah, it's, like, a it's big... It's totally, like, a, a, refl- a, a reflection of, like... The person you want to be. Yeah. Yeah. Mine is not good. <laughs> it's not. <laughs> well, because I really downscaled. Like, for a while, I was, like, anti-objects. So I was, like, I want to get rid of all my books and, like, not have many. And it is true that I mostly listen to audiobooks. So then it's, like, it is kind of purely. For a while, it felt purely about posturing. Um but then that said, now I read books more, so it's gotten back to like functional. Yeah. Um, but so so I have none of like the prestige books and all of the like industry books. So you know what right. I mean? It's like <laughs> yeah. it's not it doesn't it's not impressive. Like <laughs> Well actually it's now I realize that, you know, when I filmed all my uh videos for like the Coursera classes, the online classes, um I, the way that my office is configured, like the only logical way for me to like film myself was to point the camera at me with my bookshelf behind me oh yeah and so like every video that i ever did for all of my courses has that bookshelf did you like me. arrange it before no <laughs> what, are you, what are you kidding me it was just like it's a total disaster back there oh that's so funny but then um, that's credible in an academic environment yeah yeah and, and the funny thing is like the especially like nowadays like you know you look at you hire an assistant professor now like they're not bringing any books with them right like their bookshelf is empty right they don't want the bookshelf right exactly um but like for me the bookshelf it's essentially like an archive of like yeah (laughs) old stuff of stuff that i once read and will never read again (laughs) yeah (laughs) so you haven't like taken the time to get rid of like (laughs) right yeah. yeah yeah exactly so it's um but people have commented on it. Like when, I, when I've run into random people who've taken the courses, they've commented on the bookshelf. They're like that one that was like clearly about to fall over. You never moved it, right? <laughs> it's clear you never used this because the layout's the same. Like a year later, right? Yeah, yeah. I can't. I can't remember. We talked about how many times I've like bought like two or three copies of the same book because like I just forgot that it's like up there on my bookshelf. <laughs> So that's pretty funny. Yeah. You don't have a database with all your books logged and like you like cross reference that before you go out and buy it. Surprisingly, no. <laughs> um, but I could, there's a lot I could learn from you, I think. I would not recommend it. No. So, no. Too much time. <laughs> all right. Anything else? I had something else to discuss, but I don't. It's too late. It's okay, <laughs> and it's another book that I've like read one chapter of, so I feel like I shouldn't. <laughs> shouldn't promote it yet. Yeah, I should wait till I finish some books before I'm like, let's read this. Like, I still haven't gotten past page twenty-five on the design one. <laughs> All right. Well, you've got some homework to do. 